Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast and I am your host, Samuel. In this podcast, I interview top medical sales reps and leading medical sales executives across the entire country. And it doesn't matter what medical sales industry, from medical device to pharmaceutical to genetic testing to diagnostic lab, you name it, you will learn how to either break into the industry, be a top 5% performer within your role in sales, or climb the corporate ladder. Welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. Today we have with us a very interesting guest because of the way he rose the ranks from starting off as a medical assistant all the way to becoming the VP of Business Development for Atlas Healthcare Partners. And in that process, having experienced a degree, a master's degree, and a tenured time as a medical device sales rep. His name is Ryan Aldridge. And another reason why this episode is so insightful to listen to is because we don't just talk about how Ryan got to where he was and what he experienced throughout his career. We also get into what he's seen in his current role and how the future of healthcare is really moving towards ASCs, ambulatory surgery centers, where a provider can perform procedures outside of the hospital, something that providers are looking to do, something that patients want to avoid having to go to hospitals. And again, it's the future of healthcare. And we even talk about how the pandemic has been sort of a catalyst for more growth within this space. So it's another great episode. Thank you again for listening to the Medical Sales Podcast, and I hope you enjoyed the interview. All right. How are we doing today? Hey, Ryan, how are you? I'm well. How are you doing, Samuel? I'm good. I'm good. Um, it is, you know, another month in, in the interesting year of 2020. Where we're all trying to make sense and make things work. Uh, so, you know, today we have with us Ryan Aldridge. He is the Vice President of Business Development for Atlas Healthcare Partners. Ryan, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do? Right on. Thanks, Samuel. So like you said, I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Atlas Healthcare Partners. Uh, Atlas Healthcare Partners is a management and development company for ambulatory surgery centers. And then in my role, my team does business development where we specifically recruit new physicians to these centers. Um, we provide strong customer service to the existing utilizers, uh, physician utilizers that currently utilize the centers. And then I'm the direct link and liaison between healthcare systems. So I work with the healthcare system. Uh, we're a healthcare system leveraged surgery center company and bridge the gap between that system and the physicians and, and really try to deliver value to the community. Got yeah. it. So, so give us, who's your typical customer then? Uh, what, what is the profile of your typical customer? So we work with specialists. So it's outpatient surgery. Uh, the typical customer is a physician, a surgeon that is super high quality, of course, with all of the physicians that we work with are high quality, uh, take really good care of patients, but they're looking for a home or a really good place where they can do their outpatient elective procedures, whether it's eye procedures, their ophthalmologist, orthopedic, surgery, whatever it might be. We just provide a, a, an OR space um, with a really, really good culture and a really good team that creates sort of a secondary home for them to do these procedures at. Nice, nice. And how, how, I mean, with this type of sale, how do you typically acquire new customers? Uh, are your sales reps out there cold calling? Is this from relationships from other parts of the business? How does it work within Atlas? It's a good question. So we have a marketing, we have a marketing team as well that creates some awareness and gets us in touch with different groups, different entities and throughout the state and in the other states that we serve. But our team is really divided uh, into two buckets. And so we have a director of business development that's responsible for new business acquisition. So those team members' jobs, they buy service line. And so service line being the specialty service line, we really target 12 unique service lines or specialties in each one of these centers. I won't go through all 12 right now. Right. Uh, the idea is that we, we look at the market, we look at all the players in the market, um, we look at where alliances or allegiances currently are to either existing ASCs or other healthcare systems. And then they come up with a strategic plan to go execute and, and um, find unique physicians that 
would fit into what we're doing and uh, would be able to participate in our centers. The other bucket is our manager of business development for all of their existing medical staff. And we have over 400 uh, to 500 physicians currently utilizing our centers across the market. Wow. Our job is just to maximize the experience and, and make it strong as a physician experience as possible. Because our whole job is really to provide service to physicians. Right, right. I can imagine this is, this is a rapidly growing field. Would you, would you agree? I would. Yeah, there's a lot of data on that. ASCs are, uh, are, are blowing up. They're expanding. That, that market, I think Becker's had an article where they released the five-year cager through 2025, and I think it was somewhere in the realm of like 21% year over year. Wow, 21%. So with this kind of industry, would you say that it's getting to a place where surgeons are actively trying to find companies like yours to get a, to get a part of this, this growth? Absolutely. So we're, like I said, we're a system leverage company. I think surgeons just in general are, are looking for, if they have outpatient elective cases and they want to, they want to serve those patients, there's a lot of mechanics in the market through payer payment systems. Um, that's being the primary driver of, they're just looking for a surgery center strategy. And so whether it's a system like ours, where we're, we're working in partnership with the healthcare system, yeah. or they're trying to build it and solve it on their own, or they're, I mean, there's even out of network plays that are out there, of course, so many different ways to do a surgery center. It's really in the structure of the partnership. That's I think that's a lot to the table. Right, right. No, that's excellent. How is this, what's it been like to provide this opportunity for surgeons and surgeons taking advantage of it during this COVID time? How has it affected the business? It's a good question. So COVID, is, COVID has had some, as you know, I mean, everybody, like you said, trying to survive and thrive here. <laughs> right. Uh, we shut down. So we, part of the mandate back in April and May, all elective procedures, except for really, really urgent or essential elective surgery, was shut down in the state of Arizona, or at least Phoenix, market for April and most of May. Uh, so we had to adapt, and that was, as you can imagine, interesting times for, for, the, uh, for the growth of the organization. But what we found, two things. So we found that uh, overall patient traffic and patients delaying their care was down or not down, excuse me, patient visits were down, but patients delaying care was up. Uh, what we heard in the market was anywhere between 30 to 40% uh, foot traffic and clinic visits down overall in our specialist office. But over that time period, when we rebounded May through June, we had more new physicians start in our surgery centers than any other time in the last two years. So we set records. So we saw new, we saw an explosion in new starts, new, new customers entering the, entering the business, mm -hmm. but all those customers were down. So the leading indicator is good for growth, right. although our revenue looked like it was flat. So what explained that? Why, I mean, with, with less elective procedures to do, with, with patients delaying care, what explained this new explosion of, of new customers in light of all that? I think the more, I think across all industries, not just in healthcare, but if you look at what COVID's doing in technology and you look at the stock price of Amazon, you look at all these other companies, COVID is forcing companies to readapt their strategy to go virtual, to go from home, to do all these different things. I think we're seeing changes in the market across the board accelerate 10 years in timeline. You know, you're seeing other companies fall out. They just can't survive. Sure. Seeing other companies that do survive thrive. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, ASCs are one of those models that are the future of healthcare that are starting to thrive. Um, what I think the key drivers are, it's, it's been happening for a long time. CMS released a new rule. Um, they're every year they do the new rule, um, showing that uh, they are announcing that they were going to eliminate the inpatient only list for the hospital or orthopedics across multiple other service lines. Huge deal. Um, they've also continued to drive payment incentives towards outpatient surgery. So that's been happening for a while. COVID, I think, compounds that. In uh, if you're a patient and you're going, you know, before you go out hospital because it seems like the safest place to go. There's care there, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you're a patient looking at the same situation, you go, man, the hospital is where you go, where sick people go. I'm a healthy person. I just want to get my ACL repaired or something like that. Why would I go where sick people go when I can have the same procedure done in a safe setting and go home the same day? Yeah. I think it's driving patient preference across the board and adoption really of this, of this type of model. The market itself is moving more is, is moving the direction of can we provide the same quality of care at a lower at a lower cost and that as healthcare is becoming more consumer driven with higher deductibles 
patients are looking for that value. And this is a value, value-based care play. Um, it's difficult on hospitals, and I think it's simultaneously helpful for payers, but the reason they're both moving this direction is as the United States and as the world, as, po- as the population grows, all of these, all of, all of health systems and all of payers are struggling with the same type of concept. How do we provide population-based health care? So how do we take care of, you know, we have this insurance company now, we've got all these patients. So why is it the right thing to do to provide a low-cost alternative and take care of the entire population's health care across the continuum? Right, and I heard one of your callers or one of your one of your uh, members on a different call uh, talked about incentives in healthcare and what drives health and what yeah, maximizes yes, health. Yes, yes. Talked, talked about it from the insurance perspective, and I think there is a place for the end game for healthcare to to try and take care of as many pa- patients as possible, even if those patients put themselves in a different risk profile. So there is a place and there's probably a place for basic healthcare of some type of insurance where we ensure people that have heart attacks and we have sure people that have cancer and other things like that to take care of basic emergent medical needs. Sure. But aside from that, if you start going away from preventative care and education and behavioral health and uh, just the fee for service types of different models, whether it's pain or whether it's orthopedics or whatever it may be, and you make based on a patient's or a consumer's choices, whether they're healthy or not, the more not healthy patients are going to end up paying more. At a certain point, those patients are going to be uninsurable. They're going to fall out of a different bucket. That's going to decrease the overall welfare of society and the population at large. So if you're a healthcare system, there's a fine balance between do we want the individual to take all the accountability for their own actions? And I think in large, in, in, there's definitely an argument for that. There's also the social responsibility of do we take care of the population at large to make sure that we contribute to the entirety of the welfare of everybody across the market. So the economy continues, nothing's interrupted and people are taken care of. Um, Hospitals and payers know that in the future of medicine is whether it's single payer, whether it's not single payer, whatever happens on Capitol Hill, they need to take care of large populations of patients in order to promote the entire well-being of society. And that's what everybody's structuring this to do. And so, the surgery centers are one component of that delivery network. Hospitals are the other. Again, go research all the other ancillaries. Everything else across the board is a piece of it. How do you unite all the, connect all the dots, provide the most care at the most affordable price, and still have patients do the right thing? Got it. Now, that, that actually makes me uh, think of another question. So when it comes to, you know, let's say this ambulatory surgery center growth just, just really explodes. I mean maxes out what ultimately is going to start happening with the hospitals so there's the, there's discussions that happen every single day about that yeah um, i think there's always a place for the hospitals the hospitals are a, a they're an acute care they're an acute care resource where as the population can, again continues to grow there are always going to be high high risk procedures i wouldn't call high risk procedures but high acuity procedures at the right place to do those surgeries and procedures in the hospital. Transplants, heart, cancer, all of these really, these things that are, are that cause patients to be really sick, they need to be done. Uh, patients are gonna need places to stay. And I think the, the overall trend and the strategy is, as population growth continues to move forward, more of those procedures are gonna happen in the hospital. And as this transition occurs over the next five years, decade, whatever it might be, the elective procedures are ASC. And then ultimately, you know, we've seen in movies, those procedures that move to an ASC may not, it may not be the last stop. 15 years from now, we might be looking at some type of outpatient hub where you walk into a box and get your treatment or you get your surgery, right? And it's, whether it's an office space setting or whether it's some other type of crazy robotic device that these vendors are producing now that can do it all for you. Right. right. It's an evolution of healthcare that hospitals will continue to remain a vital piece of that delivery network. Surgery centers are going to emerge as another vital piece of it. And then further down the line, there's going to be more dots that come into play of different business models, different healthcare models that emerge. Got it. What's the challenge? I mean, you you really really established that hospitals are moving this direction. They're they're in alignment with this ASC, ASC growth. But what is the challenge for hospitals as ASCs continue to grow? What, what are they challenged by? Hospitals are challenged because they, you know, they've, what we say internally as part of our partnership with a large hospital system 
is we're helping a large integrated hospital system become a large integrated delivery network. And what we mean by that, um, the challenges for the hospital have, are based on the different payment mechanisms that happen at the Medicare level and then all the private payer level. The incentives to do elective surgery or electives to provide care are really based on the hospital-based delivery system. The amount of cost savings with simultaneously redistribution of revenue in the healthcare system is, has never been larger with the prospect of moving outpatient elective procedures outside of the hospital into a lower cost ASC side of service. With it, when it, if you're a large integrated healthcare network, that directly impacts your bottom line and your financials. So every single, and that's one of the reasons that we think we have a really sustainable model and a great partnership into the future is that I can almost guarantee you that every hospital system, especially the not-for-profit hospital systems, are struggling with this concept across the market in its entirety right now today. And I think we can help them solve it this or, is, or at least bridge the gap. Right, right. Does this do anything to the smaller hospitals? It, the impact of our model or just the, the overall market dynamics? Both. Depends on where the smaller hospital is located. I think that rural hospitals are essential. And there's a lot of, there's several rural hospitals still, still here in the state of Arizona. Sure. Practice and support a community. As these communities continue to expand and cities continue to grow and the, and the geography lines blend, you know, we're seeing more consolidation. I think um, within the last 10 years, there's been more consolidation of hospital and healthcare systems in healthcare than any other point in, in history. What I think COVID is ushering in is an acceleration of that of uh, that consolidation and big healthcare systems buying rural hospitals or buying other hospital systems. I also look at the surgery center opportunity in the next five or ten years as an opportunity for consolidation of the surgery center market. There's over five thousand surgery centers, I think, in the United States. I have to go back. I don't I don't have that data point on a sheet of paper anywhere. But I, th I think less than 15% of those are owned by either a healthcare system or one of the big four or five ambulatory surgery center companies. So you're talking about 80% of the market plus, and I'm being conservative, being physician owned or in some type of different relationship that's not integrated there. Yeah, that's intense. And if you flip side on the, on the opposite of that, the hospital systems are, are growing larger and larger by the day. And so, I don't know what the market holds, but I think we're placing our bet on healthcare systems continuing to consolidate and then continuing to form really tight partnerships with physicians and continuing to consolidate the ASC environment. Got it. Got it. So eventually all these ASCs, a lot of these smaller hospitals, it's all going to be under very few umbrellas eventually. I don't know how long and many years that's going to take, but I think that is the, you know, if you look at some of the for-profit systems, Tenet's a big one. Um, HCA is a big one. The not-for-profits are very regionally distributed. So at some point, you know, if you look at you look at any other industry, you look at technology, you look at medical device. Aside from physician practices and hospitals, you've got large national multinational companies. And I'm not saying that healthcare and hospital delivery networks have to get there, but I think the market and history has proven that non-disrupted markets or non-disrupted sectors, like healthcare, continues to be as much comparatively as a technology sector, move that direction over time. So I think it's only inevitable. Got it. Got it. And you see that as a great thing. I know a number of people that would see that as not such a great thing, but from where you stand, it's a great thing. I'm not going to commit to being a <laughs> Come on, right? What do you mean you're not going to commit? I'm just going to say I, I see that that's what's coming. I think for the, so I think what you're asking the question of, I think physicians would not see that as a great thing. Sure. I think large physicians don't see that as a great thing. Um, and you know, I'm a huge advocate for independent physician practice. I want to make that completely clear. Sure. So independent physicians and, and helping them build. That's really what at Atlas we, what we try and partner to do is help independent physicians flourish in a, in a relationship with the healthcare system. But I think that they're going to have to adapt business models similar to the way that the hospital system is adapting business models. And maybe, it become, maybe their evolution of those types of practices 
they can be the leaders in developing new sites of service. Physicians were really the leaders in developing the ASC site of service. This, the first surgery center ever in the United States was founded here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we actually shut it down. I hate to say that, but we moved it, shut it down and moved it back to a different site. Wow. But physician group is responsible for developing that. So what's the evolution look like? I mean, I don't know that there's going to be a, a day that we see orthopedic surgeries happening in an office based side of service in the near future. But through partnerships with a device company where we have these robots that can continue to be self-sustainable in the future and partnership with really strong surgeon groups, we need to develop new sites of service, new ways of doing surgery, new, new applications and, and new models. I think that's, that's where it's got to go. Yeah, no, I mean, that's like you said, it's, it seems pretty inevitable whether you like it or not. I'm neutral. <laughs> so let's take it back to you, Ryan. I mean, you've had quite a career and everyone's, I'm sure, very curious to understand how you got to where you are today. I'm going to take it to the very beginning, though, and take you back to college, you know, right before college even. What were you planning to do? What did you want to be? And what did you, what did you pursue right out of college? Man, well, you're taking me back before college, high school. I was a four-sport athlete in high school. Okay. What's uh, I did wrestling, football, track, and baseball. Okay. And um, I think I was too short or too slow or I mean, <laughs> jack of all trades and master of none. I heard somebody say that before. So I think I ended up not being a master of any of them. And I went to college and uh, I just went to the best school that I, that I got into at the time. Um, I had a passion for biology and chemistry and, hu and human science, really, and humans in general. So I had all this free time from where I used to practice and I chose to focus it in, into uh, what my academic passion was. I never really explored that into biochemistry. So I began biochemistry and uh, dedicated my time to that. It was a rough beginning. I was always you know, kind of like the, the athlete in high school and I had to transform into this more cerebral academic minded person. Sure, sure. I took biochemistry. I remember how rough that was. Yes. Yeah. So, so coming out of college then, uh, you, so you graduated with what, biological sciences or bio, or you graduated with biochemistry? Biochemistry and molecular biology. Nice. And then coming out of that, what was your first position? My first position was with a company called Way Laboratories. So Way Laboratories, it was a, I was a regional account manager. I had the option when I left college uh, to go through the academic track, mm -hmm. um, do more research. But uh, the the principal investigators and folks that I was working with in the lab at the time had more nervous ticks than a clock. And I just thought that my, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to follow that track and, and enjoy working with people and the human science element of it. Yeah. So um, I wanted to explore what it looked like. so I found this position as a regional account manager. I was inside sales, get phone calls all day, um, multiple States from inside a cubicle. And uh, it was a, it was a holistic pharmaceutical company. And so it was some traditional Chinese medicine, um, so just more naturopathic type of stuff, um, sure. chiropractors and, and uh, just other types of physicians. Got it. And so you were in that role. What turned you on to, I mean, eventually you worked for Medtronic and you got deep, deep into medical device sales. What turned you on to that from the position you were in with this holistic pharmaceutical company? <laughs> Early on, you know, I had, a, I had a couple, I would say intent is very important in your life, just in general. Yeah. Where I'm going with that is I didn't have a clear vision of what I necessarily wanted to do at that time. Okay. I knew I wanted to be in healthcare okay. and I just didn't know what that looked like. So uh, I, at some point or another, I got about eight, 12 to 18 months into that position, decided I really want to get into healthcare. I want to be either going to medicine as a physician or, you know, I really did want to get into device. I liked, I liked what they did. I didn't understand it that well though. I was sure. 23, you know, 24, yeah. but the decision that I made at that time was if I want to do that to get from here to there, I got to immerse myself in the industry. Yes. Sitting here in a cubicle and making calls isn't going to cut it. So I went, I actually quit that job without another job. My father broke his collarbone. I followed him into the orthopedic surgeon's office and asked a surgeon, Hey, came in like, thanks for the post-op. Do you guys have any jobs open? I just love to work as a medical assistant. So they hired me as a medical assistant. Got me to do some job shadowing in the operating room. I saw an ACL repair was the first case that I, that I ever witnessed. Um, they did some, um, some uh, meniscus repair as well through uh, arth it was, uh, arthroscopic. Um, it was just cool to see that sports medicine stuff, right? And that's when I knew being in the operating room, 
that's when I knew I wanted to do two things. I wanted to work with patients. Yeah. And I wanted to be in the OR. Wow. And uh, for about a year there, I explored, you know, being in that physician's office, thinking I was going to apply to medical school. And I just realized that it is, I admire physicians, man. It is a long road. Yes. It was a road that I was unprepared to take on. But I found that I could get the same value out of being a medical device rep in pain neuromodulation. These reps spent a ton of time working with patients and spent a lot of time in the operating room. And when one of the reps walked into that office and told me that, I followed him out and tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, man, I want to do what you do. How do I get in contact with people? And the short story is he gave me, a, he gave me his black book. He had a list of recruiters and, and other folks in the industry. And I just went back to old school uh, cold calling. What I learned as a regional account manager and just called the list, called everybody. Yeah. Got a, got a lot of no's, a yeah, lot of no's. Yeah. And um, somewhere into that, I got, uh, I was on my way home from work and I was frustrated. Got a call back from a recruiter. And uh, he's like, I like your story, man, but you're pretty light on experience. Why would somebody want to talk to you? And it was either frustration or me just being bold, but I was like, you know, your job as a recruiter, man, is just to get me in front of somebody and have the interview. And once you do that, I'll take care of the rest for both of us. Don't worry. Oh, wow. There was That's a pause. Good. Yeah, there was a pause. And then next thing I know, he's like, can you do an interview tomorrow at three? I'm like, well, whoever it is, I don't care. I'll be there. Let's do this. <laughs> so that was my very first interview with uh, Medtronic. I was with a gentleman named Dave Meyer. And I had uh, several interviews after that. And I was 25 years old on July 27th of uh, 2009 was my first day. Excellent. So, you know, I want to take it back a little bit. I mean, you quit your job where you were because you were so clear that you knew you wanted to be in healthcare, whether it be as a, as a rep of some sort or as a physician, you had the confidence to say, you know what, I, I believe enough in myself and what I'm capable of. And I know I want to be in this industry. So I'm leaving. Is that, is that pretty accurate? That is accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I got to a point, you know, I think Steve Jobs said in a speech one time, if you wake up enough days in a row and you don't like what you're doing, right. Change what you're doing. Right. Right. And that was really that mentality. I mean, it was you know, being there and realizing that I'm not going to get to point B if I'm starting at point A and it's just inaccessible. And so you know, anywhere in your career, man, I would, I would recommend, you know, figure out if you're not getting what you need, figure out a way to fast wire or short circuit it so you can, you can accelerate that timeline to the next step as much as possible. Maybe that involves a different direction. Maybe it involves a different pay cut. Maybe it involves being very humble and moving back into your mother's house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you did, you did. So when you became a medical assistant, you moved back into your mother's house. I did for a year. Ah, and it's because you were that clear. I was that clear. I was living alone and I moved back to be a medical assistant. Um, it was also selfishly, it was a way to save money. Right. But it was just, I need to go back to fundamentals. And, and that's one thing I, I went the research track in college. Sure. So really set up to go and, and go on to like a, you know, a, a master's program or a, um, different type of academic program. I never really explored what my passion was. And so if you have takeaways, if you've got a passion, you know that you want to be in healthcare or you want to work with people, or if you want to work with technology, whatever it may be, you're not going to work in technology by working with, you know, by laying bricks or something like that. You know, you got to do, you got to, you got to start somewhere right. and get the experience to move on to the next level. Right. No, it's, it's well said, well said. Excellent. And then, and when you were a medical, when you were a medical assistant, you got to see enough procedures that turned you on to these reps that, oh, wow. So there's these reps that do this kind of job or were you already doing some kind of behind the scenes research to find out about this, this, uh, this job that these reps had. No. So I knew about the, I knew about reps in general for, you know, even back into college and it was always something I looked at and like, okay. I think it'd be nice to get into. I see. Again, intent. I was already intending to go down that road. Okay. Uh, like your Put a couple other dots. I had to connect a few dots before I got there. Got it. Excellent. All right. So you get to Medtronic and you had quite a career there. I mean, you were met with Medtronic for about nine years. Uh, when I look at your profile, you, you had a number of roles, associate clinical specialist, clinical specialist, therapy consultant, and then senior therapy consultant. Walk us through the, what that experience was like and what, we, what you were starting to discover as you continued your career while you were at Medtronic. So good question. It's, it's always, it's very humbling and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about yourself and your development. I don't think of it that way or myself that way, but uh, looking back on it, it's, it's, you never know what the next step looks like until you get there. Mm -hmm. 
early on in my career, uh, and the way that I grew up, my father always told me hard work is always rewarded. And so I put my nose down and just grinded out. And that was one thing I'm, I'm still good at. But early on was, was really good at just putting my nose down, grinding out and looking for the next step. I had a manager that, uh, that came to me. I told him that uh, about two or three years in with chronic. And he's like, that's great. And that's true. But you also have to be strategic and you also have to plan your next steps and you have to help chart your own career. Because if you don't, there's a difference between advocating for oneself, right? And if you don't create an opportunity or advocate for yourself in the right ways, you're not going to achieve what you want. And that was really a big shift for me of realizing that. And that's when I started to have those conversations of what's next? How do I get there? What, what, are, the, what are the criteria that I need to meet to get to that next level? Um, so that's where it began. I think the real big next step is the opportunity wasn't going to be there for me in California. Uh, I was four years in with Medtronic. A um, lot of things in my life intersected, but the uh, opportunity that I wanted for the next, the next step up came open in Phoenix. And um, I was just in the right place and was able to make a move. Being, being open to make a move and move in geography to, to accelerate your career is an essential step a lot of times, especially in medical device these days. You know, you find more people that are more open to moving ultimately move up a lot quicker than those that aren't. Right. No, of course, relocation is, is key when you want to truly advance your career. So at Medtronic, what were you selling? I mean, what was the devices? And, you know, not, not every device, right? But generally speaking, who was your customer base? What types of devices were you selling? So it was pain neuromodulation. It was spinal cord stimulators and intrathecal drug delivery systems for either opioids, morphine, or intrathecal baclofen. Okay. Okay. The reason why it's so, you know, I... I I make it a point to, for you to mention that. It's because what, what always interests me about you is you were a sales rep, a medical device sales rep, and, and then you transitioned into getting into business development within healthcare systems uh, with your first role being Banner Health. So, you know, I want to know, and then in, in addition to that, you went ahead and furthered your education uh, through that transition. So I want to know, where was your mind towards the end of your career with Medtronic? You know, when you were a senior therapy consultant, uh, you're selling these types of, of devices. Um, where did you start? What were you starting to notice that made you say, you know what, it's, it's time to make a new move. There's a lot of factors that go into that, Samuel. So, sure. you know, for me it was, and maybe I'll answer it a different way, but if you go back and even back to college, I could talk about biochemistry and then going into business and then going into sales and right going through Medtronic, the, the thing that I hold, I, I firmly believe in is you, whether it's a product and more importantly, your personal brand in your, in your career track or your career arc, you got to radically differentiate. And whether it means being a biochemist and going into sales and then going into being a medical assistant and then going back into a medical device, finding the pathway to success is a big part of it. I think the more differentiation you knows that you have in your, in your, uh, in your development, when you sit and you're able to tell your story in front of that, that next person that's going to be either the recruiter or going to be the manager, and you can tell a different story about your brand and what you bring to the table. That's what I really tried to do with my career. And, and my time with Medtronic, I think at every step, you know, there's the value that you bring in your day-to-day -day job for both your company and your customers. And there's the value that you bring outside of the job. Always be more relevant than the person next to you or the person you're selling against. It's the same thing in, in the corporate environment as well. What value can you bring to the organization that maybe projects somebody to think about the business in a different light? And at every step, I was always trying to frame my brand in that way. Um, and then towards the end there, you know, I came to the decision point of I'm, a, I'm in a mature territory doing medical device sales. You know, the, uh, the salaries in medical device sales, depending on what you get into, there's still some really lucrative salaries out there. And so it became, for me, it was that decision point of, you know, do I remain here and then let my career be dictated about environmental changes and just make as money as for, make money for as long as I can? Sure. Or do I challenge myself and take all that differentiation that I've created and now through self-development by going back to school and get an MBA and currently while I was in those last few years with Medtronic and package that and do something really cool. And you know, they say that um, opportunity is the intersection of preparation and 
opportunity. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, I prepared myself for the opportunity and I achieved locker success or we want to call it. And um, I know I'm talking a lot, but going back to it, you know, I always wanted from the very time I was young, for some reason, these, I looked at the future of medicine and it seemed like the independent providers that were thriving were the ones that formed themselves in multi-specialty clinics or multi-specialty medical office buildings. The surgery center that was co-located and they all partnered and got together in these things. And I, my first year with Medtronic, I recognized that. I learned that. I always wanted to be in the surgery center space. A vision of mine was to have my own surgery center company someday. So it's just really neat for this to come full circle and find a startup opportunity with a group of gentlemen that are founding a surgery center company. Right. Kind of like you put that out into the world and nine years later it comes back. It was really neat. That's beautiful. So, okay. So a couple of things. So yes, you are right. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And for you, when you decided, so you said early on in your career with Medtronic, you discovered that there's a trend here. So was it that the trend drove you to get that education or was it kind of like a, a, a vague idea and you felt that you needed education for differentiation and then within the education you got clear? Which one was it more of? Man, when I graduated college, I always wanted to get a master's. I figured that was, I looked at the market and said, this is a key differentiating factor. Yeah. That was all in my mind. Sure. Um, I'm very... I'm not a 10 Xer necessarily. I'm not sure what the 10 X law is and all that stuff. I haven't, sure. I haven't heard that as much. Okay. I'm a firm believer in that you got to do more in order to be more, you got to do more than the competitors around you. So you look at all of your peers as competitive space. I wanted to be a vision to be an entrepreneur. And I looked down the road and said, you know, my first year with Medtronic Surgery centers, everybody that's thriving is, is operating these surgery centers and is, has these, you know, co ecosystems and partnerships that they formed. This looks sustainable. In California, it's either healthcare system or this. Um, but then as far as moving up, I always wanted to go back and get my master's. I figured that MBA with a biochemistry background would be radical differentiation of my personal brand again. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I found the time and created the opportunity for myself through conversations with my manager to do that. Excellent. So it kind of, yeah, you had it all going for you. I mean, you were seeing the opportunity, you already wanted the education, you put it all together. And of course it clearly worked out for you. Uh, that's excellent. So then talk to us about what helped you make the actual transition. I mean, you went from Medtronic to Banner Health. What actually happened? So I was, so I graduated with my MBA in healthcare sector management from uh, the WP Carey School at ASU. As the outstanding graduate, uh, top student in the class. So that was not planned. That was just awesome. Excellent. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the next few months, I was just trying to plot the next course. And uh, what, what happened is, I think it's all just time in the market. You know, there, I was open to ideas, exploring things and, you know, connecting the dots. A friend of mine called me and said, hey, man, I've, I've heard about this position. I think it's something that you would like. And he told me about it and I was like, that's amazing because aside from me actually owning the company, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And it's something that I've you know, been wanting to get into for several years. And so okay, hold on, hold on. What did he tell you? Tell us what he told you. How did he paint the picture of the opportunity? <laughs> so, a good friend of mine. And we're still very, we're still very good friends. Um, oh. this week actually, but he uh, was, so looking for other opportunities and he just had an interview. And so a recruiter contacted him. I'm not sure how, uh, how he got, how they got connected, but he interviewed for this position. And then just out of the blue, he's like, this seems like a really awesome position and called me to tell me about it. And uh, at the end of it, it's really cool. You know, having good relationships and having good network is massively important because you know, he told me all about the position he just interviewed for. Um, that it was an exciting opportunity. And then, you know, with my background, um, he thought I'd be really interested and I'd be excited about it. It was awesome that he shared that because it was a position he just interviewed for. Um, I then went to tell him about the previous nine years and kind of this vision that I had and something in the industry that I always wanted to be in. Yeah. So got even more excited. He didn't know that part. Got even more excited about it. And then I asked him at the end if, I, if he'd be okay if I interviewed for it. Yeah. And he said, sure, go ahead. Here's the recruiter's information. Um, again, we have a really good relationship. We passed along the recruiter's information. I reached out and... and um, through a recruiter completely outside of healthcare or medical device. 
uh, she made the connection and um, I met the company's founders and it was, I think with everything that led up to that, all my preparation, uh, I recognized what the opportunity was. I think from the outset that it was a young company, it was um, a company with founders that needed somebody that could come in and provide the guidance from a physician relationship standpoint, and then really scale out and build a uh, physician sales slash recruiting wing to help staff these outpatient centers. And everything that I just learned, I looked at all the market trends and just made sense. Got it. Got it. And this, this was the business development opportunity at Banner Health. See, thank you. Yes. So it's the same founders. And so Banner Health is, uh, was Atlas Incubator. So what that means is they, they agreed to uh, host this company for a year as the founders built out their management team. So when I was hired, I was first hired with Banner Health as the senior director for ambulatory surgery. Sure. And um, that was in September of 20, 2018, I guess. Uh, but the full intent the whole time is on January 1, 2019, we rolled over and became Atlas Healthcare Partners. And so knowing that, I came in early and over the three or four next four months, had a chance to plan and build out this plan. And then starting in January, recruited the team, put the team together and just took off running and building simultaneously in that direction. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're right. Timing was excellent for you. All your education, everything you prepared to do, and you literally jumped into a crazy time and were able to just be explosive during it. So that's, that's a beautiful thing. Um, okay, so once again, I think it's so interesting that you had this picture in your mind long before you got the opportunity. So now you can say that you're sort of living this entrepreneurial corporate position that's allowing you to you know, fulfill these dreams that you had going back to when you first started working. I guess you could, I guess you could say that, yeah. <laughs> that's excellent. Um, Definitely a vision that's come to fruition, so. Yeah, no, I mean, really, obviously. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, maybe give us three things. And this is for, for our audience. Three things that you believe are essential um, if you want to kind of have the explosive career that you've had. You know, when you just think back to everything you've been working on, how you've been looking at things, what are three essential things that, that people that are maybe in roles they've been in for a while and they've been wanting to make a move or they're even new to the role and they know they don't want to be in that role for very long. What are three things that they just need to keep in mind to, to help them? I, I was actually going to say you have the best like lead up. <laughs> <laughs> the, you'll, you'll the stop. Master of the pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, this is, this is going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's hard just to drill down on three things though. I think, you know, it's important to continually invest and develop yourself, you know, some of the things for this position that I think were essential to make in the transition is people get so narrowly focused on recruiting that next physician and getting your widget or your product or your feature, or your benefit into the next physician's office and medical device. Yeah. Start to learn about payment mechanisms in healthcare, learn about the ACOs, learn about the ACNs, learn about the differences. If you're a medical group versus an independent provider, how do they contract? You know, when they contract with the payer, are they reimbursed differently? How does that structure look like? What does that, you know, how's that off the, the efficiency look like? What's the benefit to the hospital system or healthcare system to do that? How are integrated delivery networks structured? It's not just a hospital. It's not just a medical group. What are all the other ancillaries and touch points that they, that they bring up into that, right? Um, learn as much as you can. And I'd, I'd say learning outside of your day-to-day -day business is the same thing as self-development. It's everything is a story that you tell in front of somebody. And so and that's not three things, but say learning, self-development. Um, you know, don't just like in sales, ask for what you want. And if you're not finding it, be open-minded to the point of making a change and exploring a different opportunity, even if it's one you didn't think about before. Yeah. Um, and then last, again, going back to that concept of pick the path that may be more difficult. Sometimes it's not always easy to learn something new, sure. but choose things that allow you to give your brand a different perspective, uh, differentiate yourself, whether it's again, learning something new, taking on something in your company that allows you to learn, you know, the business development, VC side of things, whatever it may be. Yeah. And I've all, uh, 
all those components. Got it. Got it. So yeah, I, thank you for sharing that. You know, Ryan, I think this is important things for people to, to hear from someone that's that's experienced and been as successful as you've been. Uh, you're also in a hiring position. I mean, you're you're responsible now for building much more than a team. It sounds like you build multiple teams. For people that want to get into this kind of of of, in, of role, you know, get into health system development. Uh, what would you say, what do you say you look for in candidates? If they want to get into, let's say someone wants to be in your team, they, they're listening to this now and they're saying, wow, you know, I'd love to be on, on the growth of what Atlas is doing and, and work within expanding this, this you know, these, these uh, ambulatory uh, centers and just really grow things to a next level. What would you say you look for in candidates? What do you need to, to see when you're, when you're interviewing people? Best candidate I ever view, or inter, excuse me, best candidate I ever interviewed asked me more questions than I asked them. They interviewed me. And I think when you do that, you prepare to that level to interview the person sitting across from you. It shows your, it shows your strategic planning. Um, it shows your, in my mind, it shows your grit. I think grit is a key component. Everything that we've done in the last two years, there was no landscape here in front of us of what this division looked like or what we were going to have to go out and accomplish. And it hasn't always been easy. You got to and you got to dig down. And when when things don't go according to plan, you got to have a good positive mental attitude and adjust. So it tells me that. Um, it also tells me how they're going to be in front of customers. I'm look, ideally looking for consultative reps that are able to do a lot of discovery and dig down into the most crucial pain points of the physicians that we work with or the other healthcare that, that uh, healthcare executives we work with sure. formulate comprehensive solutions that aren't just, Hey, use our surgery center or Hey, use our medical device or Hey, use our pharmaceutical, whatever it may be. Get an understanding of the comprehensive customer through asking questions, portray that to your interviewer. And that lets me know how you're going to go out and interact with our customer base. Got it. And for your team specifically, what type of qualification should a person have? You know, what should they have in their back pocket to even be considered to be on a team like yours? Good question. So for level of positions that are here in, uh, in, in our first iteration of the team, we've all come from either background in medical device or in healthcare hospital system business development. Um, our manager level positions either come from background in uh, medical device as well, but also medical imaging and uh, laboratory diagnostics. So specifically in healthcare, but I think that's the first iteration. You know, what we're working on getting better at right now is, is building repeatable and scalable systems in house that for the next iteration, whether outside of our current healthcare system, when we were positioned to go expand into another healthcare system, we need to duplicate what we did here. And what, I'm, what I mean by saying, what I, what I mean by that is we're not necessarily going to need people with 10 years of experience. We're not going to need people with five years of experience. We need people with good character, strong motivation and energy, super inquisitive that have that grit and have maybe one to two years of experience in, in a, it's, it's, whether it's in healthcare or some other type of relatable sale that can come in and just execute and execute the plan. That's excellent. Wow. Ryan, this has been so enlightening for so many. Um, Okay, we're going we're gonna to wrap things up here, but I want to ask you just a few questions before we do. I always ask this for my guests, and I'm going to ask you as well. Take us back to right before you started as a medical assistant, and you can tell yourself anything. With all the information and wisdom that you've gained since then, what would you tell yourself right before you started? Don't stop. It's going to pay off. <laughs> I, I really like that. Don't stop. It's going to pay off. That actually makes too much sense. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Ryan. This is great. Uh, again, another episode on the Medical Sales Podcast. Is there any last words that you'd like to share with the audience uh, before we close up today? I love these. I love these build-ups, man. This is, oh, man. This is gold here. Go ahead. No, just um, I think I think I just I think I just said it. You know, stay uh, stay humble, stay hungry, and continue to differentiate yourself and looking for opportunities, and they'll they'll pop up in front of you, and then seize it, jump on it when it comes. Couldn't be said better. Ryan, thanks again. This, this was excellent. Um, you know, I, we could talk all day about this, and I appreciate the time you took. Uh, we're definitely going to follow up, though. Everyone wants to know where it is this feature going to take us, and when it gets there, what are you guys going to be up to next? So, again, thank you for the time. 
And, and yeah, thank you for being on the Medical Sales Podcast. Thank you, Samuel. Look forward to seeing you again. Definitely. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, I have a couple programs that show you exactly how to break into the medical sales industry, become a top performing medical sales professional, and also how to masterfully navigate your career to executive level leadership. Check out these programs and learn more at EvolveYourSuccess.com. Stay tuned for more awesome content with amazing interviews.